Welcome to Inspire Me with Jay, a podcast focusing on meditation, the near-death experience, and all things spiritual. Hello, this is Jay Spillers with Inspire Me with Jay. Today, my special guest is George W. Saris. How are you, George? I am well. Thank you very much for giving me the privilege to joining you and talking to you. So you believe in the reconciliation of all things or universal salvation. Why don't you explain what you mean by that and how that works in your opinion? Um, I'm convinced that scripture actually teaches that in the end of time, all those God created in his image will be with him in heaven. What that means is hell is temporary in its duration, remedial in its nature. But at the end of time, everyone will be with God in heaven. It's through Christ. Um, basically, what I say is that Jesus Christ succeeded in what he came to do. He said he came to seek and save what was lost, and he succeeded in his mission. Um, God is good. God is all wise. God is all powerful, and he is all loving. And he started out with a very good creation, and he will end up with a very good creation. So that's basically what it is. Mm -hmm. How did you arrive at this view? Yeah, it was kind of interesting. Um, I uh, I had a, a good family. My father was a very good father. And my mother was a good mother. They weren't perfect by any means, but they were definitely excellent parents for me, anyway. Um, I always knew that my parents would never abandon me. They may discipline me, and they did at various times. They disciplined me, and sometimes fairly severely, but I knew that they would never abandon me. Well, when I was a junior in college, I met a group of uh, students who had a different quality of life than I did. Uh, they were talking about their relationship with Jesus Christ and how it had changed their lives and gave them power uh, in their lives. I was fascinated. I had made some kind of a profession of faith when I was a young boy, probably somewhere between 9 and 12 years old, but I didn't really understand what it all meant. And um, when I met these students, at, uh, as I said, in my junior year in college, I was fascinated by what they said. And, with, and I, I, I can remember talking with this one man, Conrad Cook, and uh, thinking, why is it that I'm a second-rate Christian? I knew that if I died, I was going to go to heaven because I prayed the right prayer when I was 9 or 12 years old. But that was about it. Why couldn't I see any power in my life? And he shared that basically the problem was that I was seeing God as either uh, Aladdin's genie, where if you rub the lamp the right way, you get this awesome power at your disposal, or a Santa Claus who gives you good things if you're good and coal if you're naughty, um, or maybe as a divine watchmaker who set the world in motion and then just kind of left and went on its way. And uh, what he was saying is that, no, God has to be the one in charge. You receive God's power when you seek to do his will, because he empowers you to do what he wants you to do. Well, that was life-changing for me. And so I uh, asked God to basically be in charge of my life. My life was changed. I, I was as I say, in some places, um, I was heading in one direction and I turned around and headed back in the other direction for that. Well, as I began to read through scripture, it didn't seem to me that the kind of God I read in scripture was the kind of a God who would either cause or allow billions of people to suffer consciously forever. But I had never read anything different. I, in fact, after I graduated from college, I worked with Campus Crusade for Christ for four years, and then I went to seminary. Uh, I was there for three years, uh, getting an, uh, a Master of Divinity. And uh, everything I had ever read or heard was always that God was going to ultimately send, really, the majority of mankind to a never-ending hell. But it didn't seem right, and it bothered me. And so at the end of my last year in seminary, I decided that I would use that as the topic of a research paper. And so uh, I started doing some research, and every systematic theology, every book I read was the same thing. Hell is never-ending conscious torment for 
majority of mankind, until I came across this book. It was written in 1878 by a man named Edward Beecher. He was actually the uh, brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe, of Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, fame. And uh, he wrote a book titled History of Opinions on the Scriptural Doctrine of Retribution. And so I got it out of the library and started reading it. And at the beginning of the book, he said, this is not the book I intended to write. I actually, as a result of my research, came to a different conclusion than what I started out with. So what is the different conclusion? What did he start out with? Well, it turns out that he was doing a lot of uh, history study and that the early church for about the first 500 years after Christ rose from the dead, the dominant view, according to him, and I think he was correct, the dominant view was that God would ultimately restore all of his creation, the perfection he initially intended. Um, there were three views that were uh, allowed at the time. Homeless punishment was one. Uh, annihilation of the wicked was another one. But the dominant one was that God would ultimately restore all of creation. God, I had never heard that. Nobody, no one had ever even mentioned that this was a view that at one time was held by leaders, major leaders within the Christian church. And then uh, he went on in his book and he pointed out a couple of other areas. Um, one in particular was the definition of the word that is translated as eternal or everlasting in the English Bibles. Um, it's uh, ion in Greek and olam in the Hebrew. Well, the word doesn't mean never ending. What it means is the end is not known. And so it's used sometimes to tell of things in the distant future. It's used other times to tell of things in the not too distant future at all. Um, and so uh, I did some more research. I wrote a paper. I actually got a, an A minus on my paper, which I was kind of encouraged by because <laughs> I came to this conclusion that God was going to ultimately restore all of creation. And uh, I was excited. I thought, wow, I just discovered something. And so I presented it to obviously the, the professor that taught that course. And uh, then so a couple of other professors that I knew, and they all looked at me somewhat patronizingly and said, well, George, good job. It was a nice research paper. But what you don't realize is that in the subsequent centuries after the first 500 years, the Christian church came to the clear realization that hell was endless for the majority of people who uh, he had, that God had ever created. And so I kept it as a private hope for a long time and actually shared my paper with different people um, that were going through difficult times, especially those people that had had a loved one who had passed away and never had made any kind of profession of faith. And um, then in 2007, 2007 I, uh, I thought, you know, I need to update my paper because it's a research paper written in seminary, you know, 40 years before. And uh, I just need to update it and make it more readable. And so I started doing some more research. And as I did more research, I became increasingly excited about what scripture actually taught. And then um, I uh, ended up writing a book. My research paper turned into a book that was published in 2017, uh, 10 years after I started my research. I was turned down by 28 publishers um, and finally uh, published it on my own. And uh, interestingly, it won an award. It won the uh, silver medal in theology in the um, Illumination Book Awards for exemplary Christian, Christian literature. So uh, that's where I am. I spent several years of my life stressed, anxious, and depressed. I needed to find something that would make my life work. For me, that was meditation. With meditation, I found the peace of mind that I was looking for. I found the happiness. And I found a way to improve every area of my life. My emotional life, my spiritual life, my relationships. I was able to discover things about myself. I can give you the tools to meditate. I will walk you through the process and hold your hand. Whether you're a beginner to meditation who's never meditated or whether you're someone who's tried meditation and it just never seemed to work, 
we can make it work. Meditation is something that everyone can do, and I can show you how. Check out my course on meditation. Well, you know, when you think about um, endless torment as a punishment, you kind of think, well, what is the point? Because it's like, okay, I'm there for a million years. I'm there for a billion years. I'm there for a trillion years. Either, you know, either have the person cease to exist, annihilate them, or restore them back. But what's the point of just leaving them out there without end forever? It just doesn't. I mean, at some level, people will say it just doesn't make sense, does it? I think you're absolutely right. And interestingly, I, I mean, I've talked with a lot of people about this over the years. And uh, most people deep down inside don't believe that God is going to endlessly punish the majority of people in the, that he's ever created. They always have some kind of a, a fudge factor, I call it, where uh, at least not the people that I love. Right. Um, my uh, my my parents who didn't have a, a faith or my child who doesn't have a faith or my spouse or my friend, uh, somebody that's close to me. I know there's some kind of way that God is going to get around that because it doesn't make sense. But they're afraid to say anything because everything they've ever heard or read says. that. So uh, but I really do believe that most people deep down inside don't really believe that God is going to do it. Because basically what it's saying is that God is either cruel, that he could have saved these people, but he didn't, or he could annihilate them, but he didn't, or that God's impotent. He's just powerless. You know, that uh, scripture actually says it's God's desire to, that all people be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, is he able to accomplish what he desires or not? And if he's not, then he's, somewhat um, uh, impotent to be able to do that. Or again, either that or else he's cruel. You, in, within the Christian world, you have two, at least the evangelical Christian world, you have two major camps. One is the Calvinist theology. The other is Arminian theology. Uh, Calvinists basically focus on God's sovereignty. And what they say is that God could have saved all mankind, chose not to. Or else you've got the Arminians who say, focus on God's love. And what they say is that God desires to save all mankind, but ultimately he's unable to do that. So the one side says, basically, God is cruel. The other side says, God is impotent. And I think the truth is, God is neither of those. God is not cruel. He's not impotent. He will accomplish his purposes um, for creation. And at the end of time, God will, again, look out on all that he has made, and he will say, it is very good. Um, hell is temporary in its duration, and its purpose is to bring people to a point where they recognize their need for God's saving grace. through Christ. You know, what some people will bring up is like, well, what about Hitler? Does that mean Hitler will eventually be saved? And of course, what's interesting about it, when you think about it, Hitler is viewed as one of the most evil people that ever lived. He killed millions of people. So it's right that we view him as evil. But if Hitler killed millions and God's going to send billions to an endless torment, it kind of puts you in an uncomfortable position because it makes God, in some sense, sounding worse than Hitler. So it's like, put Hitler aside in terms of whether he's going to be saved. Where does that put God? if he's going to send billions to an eternal hell compared to Hitler. Yeah, I think that's really good. In fact, that's really the basic challenge that atheists have against Christianity. And I was just watching uh, part of an interview with um, a, a well-known atheist, and uh, that was his argument, you know, that, that God is this has to be a cruel being. If, if he's going to send people to hell forever, then he's worse than Hitler. And therefore, I don't want to worship a God like that. And so they, they kind of throw it out. My answer usually when people talk about Hitler uh, or Stalin or Chairman Mao or, you know, all these other people that are like that, I say, well, what about the Apostle Paul? 
The Apostle Paul was someone who uh, killed Christians. And uh, he had a, a, an energy that was a vibrant energy to go out and root out any Christians he could find and put them to death. But then God changed his heart. God transformed him. Salvation is about transforming, not about punishing. We're, we're not just punishing sinners, we're transforming sinners. That's what happened with the Apostle Paul. He started out as Saul, who was a wicked, in one sense, wicked man who wanted to kill Christians, and he changed into Paul, who was a godly man who wrote a significant portion of the New Testament, and uh, was one of the, probably the greatest um, spokesman for Christianity uh, since the beginning of, of uh, after Christ uh, rose from the dead. Um, and so what I usually say, again, with regard to Hitler and those people, is that in this life, they did not repent and turn and accept God's grace through Christ. But God's grace doesn't end at natural death. God is still working in the lives of individuals in the ages, plural, to come. It talks in Scripture about this age, the age before this age, age after this age, and ages, plural, to come. So God is still at work. He never gives up. He doesn't abandon any of those he created. So I don't know how much time it will take for God to change the heart of uh, Adolf Hitler or Stalin or Chairman Mao or any of the other people like that. But eventually it will happen. Uh, it's interesting. Some of the early Christian leaders in the early church were brilliant people. Um, there's a man named uh, Gregory of Nyssa who actually added the word, the phrase, uh, I believe in the life of the age to come to the Nicene Creed. Well, he and another man named uh, Theodore of Mopsuesia pointed out that sin always leads to misery. So if you follow a sinful direction long enough, you will experience misery. And therefore, at that point, you will want to turn and begin to focus back on, why am I in this miserable situation? I need a savior. It's very much like a uh, let's say a, a drug addict or an alcoholic. Um, some I used to work with the Bowery Mission down in New York City, which is a, a mission to the homeless, although primarily drug addicts and uh, uh, alcoholics. And you'd have people that would come in there, and some of them would have their lives changed when they were in their 20s, others in their 30s or 40s. Some would come in in their 50s or, or even in their 60s. Some people that, that turn away from uh, alcoholism or drug addiction will be maybe even in their 70s. Who knows? But the reason is always the same. The reason is they came to a conclusion that the direction they were pursuing in life led them to a horrible situation. They lost their health. They lost their marriages if they were married. They lost their wealth. Um, they lost just about everything they could think of. And they suddenly realized, I have got to get out of this. They go to a place like the Bowery Mission or some other drug or alcohol rehabilitation situation. And uh, often it's because they find God. They experience God's salvation through Christ. Well, that's really what's happening, I believe, in the age to come in what we call hell, is that God is still at work in a person's life. Uh, it's just that he makes the contrasts more clearly seen and uh, at some point, they recognize their need for God's saving grace through Christ. When they turn to that, then they are transformed, and they're able to enter into God's presence. How do you answer when someone would say, um, if God's going to save everyone, what was the point of Christ dying? Because I've actually heard that. On the surface, it sounds kind of convincing, but when you break it down, it really doesn't. How do you respond to that? Yeah, that's a very good question. And yeah, a lot of people have mentioned that to me. The bottom line is the only reason why anyone can be saved is because of Christ dying on the cross. That's what pro provided the payment for our sins. I mean, the bottom line is Jesus Christ is the savior of the world, not just the savior of part of the world. And so, yeah, it's through Christ that anything like that can happen. And it's because of his death, burial, resurrection, it's his sacrificial death on the cross, it's because of him that mankind is able then to experience the, the grace that God gives to be brought into his presence. 
So, yeah, it's not that, that Christ died for nothing. It's that Christ died for everything. I usually say to the person that says that, then, why didn't Christ, if he paid for the sins of all mankind, why did he fail to actually save all mankind? And to me, he didn't fail. He actually accomplished what he needed to do. Jesus Christ is the savior of the world, not just savior of part of the world. Mm -hmm. And so your understanding would be basically in line with conservative evangelicalism that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Anyone and everyone that's getting saved is going to be saved through Christ. You just happen to believe that Christ is going to be 100% successful in it. Yeah, that's exactly correct. I mean, the, the basic difference between what I believe and what most of the other Christians believe that hold the Bible as uh, true um, is that God doesn't stop working in a person's life at the moment of physical death. He continues into the age to come. Um, it just, you know, God is not bound by time the way we are, um, and he's not bound by our physical existence in our spirits. I mean, he can work in any way he wants to. And uh, that's exactly what he's going to do. By the way, I do believe uh, my position is that scripture is inerrant. That uh, I, I think that whatever what scripture says is true. I'm not one of these guys that goes off and says, well, you know, we'll just kind of throw those verses out and we won't take them into consideration. Um, no, I actually believe that, that the Bible is true, but that the Bible teaches that God is going to ultimately restore all of mankind. Mm -hmm. In fact, like that's what my in my book, um, I wrote a book called Heaven's Door is Wider Than You Ever Believed. Um, right here, if anybody wants to see it there. Um, and uh, in there, the first section is on history, uh, looking at the history of this view. And then the second major section is on scripture itself and answering the various objections that people have with regard to um, uh you know, for example, um, how about the rich man and Lazarus? You know, mm. if he's in this situation, the rich man is in uh, hell uh, and the Lazarus is in heaven and there's a chasm between the two. How can you bridge that chasm? I, you know, how, how do you do that? Um, so uh, another one, um, in fact, one, I, I narrate books. And this morning I was narrating one book and <laughs> I was sad. The author of this book, which I have to be the author in a sense. My voice is the voice of the author, not my own voice in that. But he was talking about how, talking about heaven and hell, and um, that God uh, was going to send people to hell forever. And, and I thought, ah, oh, why did I take this book on? I should have said no when um, they offered it to me. I didn't know what it was all about. But um, uh, in the book, he... Uh, Oh, what was I just going to say? I forgot my, I lost my train of thought on that one. But anyway, um, God is going to restore all of creation. And uh, with regard to the various texts in scripture, you got to look at them in context, and find out what they really are teaching. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this passage in the gospel where one of the apostles asked Jesus, will everyone be saved? Jesus didn't give him a, point blank yes or no answer he said strive to enter by the narrow gate you know if if he meant for him to say no everyone will not be saved he could have just said it but why didn't he say yes everybody's going to be saved and maybe part of the reason was he wanted you to be focused on following him and that eventually as you read through the scriptures you'd see it but i mean that's just sort of a thought i've had on it well, I think you're actually very close to what I would say on that as well. That when he's, interestingly, you know, we get into this idea that everything that Jesus ever talks about is salvation. He's not. He's talking about life. And uh, that passage where it talks about enter the narrow gate, uh, for wide is the gate and, narrow, and uh, broad is the road that leads to destruction, narrows the gate um, that leads to life. Well, just I think it's in the verse prior to that, he's talking about life as well. And he's just talking about life in this world. I mean, if you want to find out the truth of that statement, just look at people today. I mean, they're all pursuing, you know, uh, money. 
right? Or big houses or big cars, or who's got the latest iPhone, or uh, you know, who's got the biggest boat or whatever people are pursuing, you know? And uh, that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about enter through, or pursue the things that are of value, which are is seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. Focus on all these miserable things like the majority of people do. What do they focus on? Those trivial things instead of things that are truly important. So yes, the road is broad. You want to follow trivial things? There's lots of trivial things you can find out or you can follow in this life and pursue. And there's very few that you can pursue that are leading to godliness and direction in life that is a good direction. Uh, one of the il illustrations of that I use, I live in uh, Connecticut, and we're not too far from Newport, Rhode Island. And in Newport, Rhode Island in the 1800s, late 1800s, um, a number of very, very wealthy, super wealthy people from New York City decided to vacation at Newport Beach, Rhode Island in the summer, for about six weeks in the summer. And they built these massive uh, houses, they're mansions, uh, beautiful mansions. In fact, you can tour a number of those mansions. Well, one of them that you can tour, it's called the Breakers, and it was owned by um, uh, Vanderbilts, the Vanderbilts. And uh, when you tour it, you'll find out about, uh, uh, I think it was Common, uh, not, what, is he, what do you call him? Uh, Commodore Vanderbilt that actually uh, built that particular one. And you go in there and he tells you about the, the person that's leading the tour, tells you that Commodore Vanderbilt was noted for his yachts and he was noted for um, you know, being a very wealthy person. And uh, if you just look at this beautiful, beautiful home that he used for six weeks out of the year, um, you think, wow, isn't that amazing? You know, Commodore Vanderbilt built this beautiful, phenomenal um, house to live in for six weeks, a summer home. He had phenomenal wealth. And, and as I was going through there the first time, I thought, if he ever stands before God, God's going to say, Commodore, I gave you, oh, also one other thing was, he's the person that invented the game Contract Bridge. Okay, that's a very widespread, well-known uh, game that lots of people love to play, right? So he's noted for yachting, and he was noted for inventing the game of Bridge. And I thought, well, okay, so he stands before God, and God says, Commodore, I gave you phenomenal wealth. What did you do with it? And he looks back at God and says, I invented a card game. I think, talk about trivial things. I mean, bridge is a nice game. And having nice yachts is kind of fun. But with that kind of wealth, he could have done phenomenal things to actually help people. And he invents a card game. So mm -hmm. is the world wide that leads to destruction as far as in other word, way, the word destruction in that, that verse actually means ruin, or it means um, kind of worthlessness. And uh, so the, the road to destruction or the road to worthlessness, the word to trivial thing, the road to trivial things is wide. Lots of things you can pursue that are trivial. But the road to godliness and goodness is narrow. So follow that road. I think that's what Jesus was talking about. Mm-hmm. Well, and probably most of us, to some extent, will sow some level of destruction, some level of loss, that we don't always do things perfectly. Well, everybody will do like that. I mean, we all do. You know, there's none of us are. Uh, that's right. It's a road. It's narrow, but it's still a road. You know, there's a lot of places you can do it. And you can get off the road and get back on the road. I mean, a lot of different things just using that particular analogy. Um, yeah, I mean, we all have major problems in our lives or things that we've done wrong. And uh, again, it is through Christ that we experience forgiveness. It's through God, through his spirit, whatever, that we are empowered to do good things. But the focus should be on doing things that are truly worthwhile from an eternal perspective. A number of years ago, I, um, I asked a friend of mine, I was working in New York City, with a ministry to media professionals. And um, I said to my friend, how do you show successful people that they need God? And 
he didn't even take a beat. He just said, oh, give him the book of Ecclesiastes. I thought, wow, that's a brilliant idea. So I called the American Bible Society up and I said, I'd like to order some copies of the book of Ecclesiastes. We don't have it. You can get the Bible, but we don't have just Ecclesiastes as a separate book. So I called the International Bible Society and said, I'd like to get the, a copy of the book of Ecclesiastes. We don't have it. <laughs> Again, you can get the whole Bible, but we don't have just the individual book. But they said, why do you want it? I told, I told them, but, you know, I thought it'd be a great idea to give to uh, people that um, are not realizing their need for God. And, you know, oh, that's a great idea. And so they said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We will give you the rights to use the text. You pay for the, the uh, cost of the printing. Oh, that's a great idea. So I wrote a short foreword to the book and a short afterward. The foreword to the book tells why it's important. Uh, and the afterward tells the basic message. The rest of the book is just the book of Ecclesiastes. No verse numbers or chapter numbers. Um, go read like a little book. Okay. I've got a copy of right here. My but what I found, if I can get one. Oh, nuts. Uh, what I found as I read through the book buy it anyway it's just for me mm -hmm. <laughs> I gave it away but what i found was as i read through the book solomon you know it's the book ecclesiastes is the book that says um everything is meaningless everything is vanity vanity of vanities all is vanity and uh when he says you know uh generations come generations go but the world continues on forever so it's just kind of this never-ending cycle of vanity meaninglessness the reason for that is because we die. That's what the whole book is all about. It's that if you look at life under the sun, life under the sun is the temporal world. And you, as Solomon said, he built uh, great construction projects. He, uh, he had a great name. Uh, he was the most powerful king probably almost ever lived. He was the, one of the wealthiest who would ever live. And at the end of the the time he just looks at this as it's all meaningless. Why? Because he comes to a point where death, he can't get around death. So you want to make a lot of money? Great. What happens when you die? You leave it to somebody. Who is he? Probably a fool. He's going to waste it. Or you build these great big, um, like those mansions in uh, Newport. And what happens to them? Your descendants don't want them because they're too big and, and too costly to maintain. So you sell it to a charity or somebody that's going to uh, use it for some other purpose. Whatever you do, I, I use the illustration in New York City, one of the, at least it had been, <laughs> hopefully it will continue, one of the greatest cities in the entire world. There's a major highway that goes through New York City. It's called the Deegan Expressway, Major Deegan Expressway. And I say to people, do you know who Major Deegan was? I've never found anybody that did. The only person that ever did was somebody who was sitting in front of his computer. And while I was talking to him, he Googled it to find out who Major Deegan was. But he's got an expressway in the greatest city in the world, or one of the greatest cities in the world, named after him. And you don't even know who he is. You walk down Fifth Avenue, you'll see the Fred, Fred French building. Do you know who Fred French was? He was a, a major architect at one point. But he's got a building on Fifth Avenue in New York City named after him. And nobody knows who he was. So it doesn't make any difference. If you make a big name for yourself, you become very successful at whatever it is that you become successful for. In all probability, you will be forgotten within a very short period of time. Or whatever you did will change. And that's, what, that's why people need to read the book of Ecclesiastes. Because it just tells very, very straightforwardly that what you're pursuing, if it's under the sun, it's meaningless. Now, the answer to the book of, of uh, Ecclesiastes is that things under heaven are meaningful. That's why at the end of the book, he says, uh, all is but in said, and God fear, uh, said and done, fear God and keep his commandments. Why? Because things that are done over, under heaven from the eternal perspective are meaningful and worthwhile. But if it's just things that are done on the earth, in the temporal world, then they're meaningless. 
I think that's really what Jesus was talking about, again, with regard to the wide road and the narrow road. Pursue the things that are meaningful, not just meaningless. From an eternal perspective, not just a temporal perspective. So um, is Ecclesiastes basically te um, teaching nihilism? Without God, nihilism is not essentially all. true? Well, no, I mean, is it? No, not at all. No. It's, it's teaching that things that you pursue <laughs> that are just in the temporal world are, are meaningless. And you need to wake up to that guy, girl, person, wake up to the fact that if this is what you're pursuing, you're pursuing a dead end. Pursue something meaningful, worthwhile. Mm -hmm. What are some verses that talk about universal salvation? Well, you've got the one that I think is the strongest is in Philippians, where it says that um, basically at the end of time, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, it's interesting that the word confess in that verse, if most of the time people that, that um, share that, uh, or explain that verse, they'll say, well, yeah, at the end of time, every knee will bow be forced to vow to bow they they use it like the um the roman emperor you know the roman emperor comes to town and they're going to force you to bow your knee but that's not what it's all about the word confess there confess that jesus christ is lord to the glory of god the father is a word that means to praise it means to voluntarily wholeheartedly uh acknowledge uh or confess or proclaim so what it's saying there is that no, that's not something that God is forcing people to do against their will, because that would be to God's shame, not to God's glory. I mean, if God had to force you to say, I love you, you are great, you are wonderful, that's that's meaningless. You know, that's just like programming a computer that can tell you that the computer loves you with all of its heart, but it's it's all meaningless because you're the one that forced it to do that. And so um what that verse is saying is that at the end of time. Every knee will bow, every non, uh, tongue will voluntarily, freely, wholeheartedly confess or give praise to Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father. That's one uh, major uh, one there. Jesus said, I came to seek and to save what was lost. Well, did he succeed? What he chose to do. Um, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, I think it is, it says, uh, Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. Uh, what do you say? Um, uh, it's to save the world, the savior of the world. I gotta get my. Uh, is that the, my, is that the get, verse well, about the propitiation of sin that he's not only the propitiation for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world? First John 2 2. Right, right. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, he's the savior of our sins, but also those of the whole world. Um, uh, John the Baptist, when he came in, he said, uh, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, that's a take away some of the sin. He takes away the sin of the world. So there are a number of uh, passages of Scripture that, um, that relate to that. Mm -hmm. Well, then there's that Colossians 1.20 that talks about he will reconcile all things in heaven and earth to himself. Right. And just the idea of reconciling, bringing everyone into a, a relationship, a positive relationship with God. And if I'm not mistaken, it says those in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's going to restore. So, uh, you know, God is going to bring all people into uh, a relationship with him that will be a meaningful relationship. that will never end. Mm hmm. Well, do you believe that God ever saved anyone out of hell? Do you see any verses related to that? Well, first of all, the word hell uh, is an English word. It doesn't really exist in Scripture. There are four words in Scripture that are translated by the word hell. Um, none of them mean, mean never-ending torment, a uh, place of never-ending torment. None of them do that. Um, there's... Uh, Sheol in the Old Testament, which in most modern translations is translated as grave in most of its cases. Um, 
Hades in the New Testament. That's the one that's used in the uh, parable of the rich man and Lazarus, where the rich man is in Hades. It's not hell. And interestingly, the, uh, the book of Revelation says that, hate, that Hades will give up dead that are in it. So that's a very specific, if you, the, the King James Version and the New King James Version translate that. In fact, actually the uh, original NIV, 1984 edition, translates it as hell in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. So yes, people will get out of hell because it says that the Hades will give up the dead that are in it. And um, um, there are, again, uh, so then there's a, the word Gehenna, which was basically referring to a, uh, a place that existed when Jesus was there. And a lot of uh, scholars currently believe, or have believed for a long time, that it was a garbage dump outside of Jerusalem. Dead bodies uh, of criminals and other um, people were thrown there to be just a pain. Um, and then Tartarus is the last of the four words used in scripture. And that's basically a, a prison in uh, scripture. But none of them are referring to a place of never-ending punishment. When you ask the question, did, did anyone ever get saved out of hell? Well, they got saved out of Gehenna or out of um, uh, Hades, but not necessarily because hell doesn't exist in that, in that sense of never-ending conscious torment. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, you know, why, why would you not think that God can save a, in fact there's another verse yeah i just thought of this one in psalm 139 he says uh the psalmist says if i go up to the heavens you are there if i go down to the depths you are there and the word depths is sheol which in the king james is if i go down to hell you are there is there any place where god is not i mean if god is all omnipresent in all places at all times, and he's going to be wherever people are. So he's going to be in hell in the sense of um, where, wherever these people are after they die, wherever they are after they die, whatever the punishment or the, the uh, what it's like. Scripture does not give a lot of in, uh, information about that. But yes, God is there. And so therefore, when a person recognizes their need for God, and his saving grace, and they turn to him, he says, well, gives him a big hug and brings him into heaven with him. Well, I was thinking of a specific passage, uh, 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20, talks about after Jesus died before the resurrection, he descended into Hades, preached the gospel to those that were in prison in the days of Noah, and then essentially brought them up so that they're, People in the days of Noah and maybe more were actually brought up from from Hades into heaven, and I would think that would be an example. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, a good possibility for that for sure. That's a uh, one of those controversial verses that people don't really know what <laughs> what's going on there. But an insight into that: if you go to the Eastern Orthodox Church. Eastern Orthodox Church has icons. Now, icons, everybody thinks of them as idols. They're not. They're basically teaching tools. They're, they're pictures that are drawn um, in a very specific way in order to teach truth. Well, the icon of the resurrection is very interesting. The icon of the resurrection has Jesus standing on doors that are broken, uh, and they're in the shape of a cross. And... Um, they're kind of it's the doors of hell. And underneath those doors that Jesus is standing on, you see broken locks and ropes uh, in this kind of dark area. And then Jesus is reaching out his hand on one side to, I think it's Adam and Eve. And on the other side, or maybe, I can't remember, might be one of the apostles. I can't remember who they are. But he's basically reaching out his hands to all these people that he is bringing back into his presence. And that's an icon to describe what happened on the second day. Now, Jesus crucified on Friday. What happened on Saturday? And then he was raised on Sunday. Well, on Saturday, he went in and he basically, like you said, preached the gospel to those who were dead in uh, 
hell and he broke the the bonds he broke the doors of hell in fact you know jesus said um to peter you are peter and on this rock i will build my church and the gates of hades or the gates in the some of the versions the gates of hell it's actually gates of hades um will not prevail against the church well gates are defensive structures we're on the offense to break down and destroy the gates of hell we're not in the defense it's not that the gates of hell are attacking us is that we're attacking the gates of hell to break it down. And what Jesus said is that the gates of hell will not be able to withstand the onslaught of the Christian church and the Christian world. Yeah, and I think, doesn't the Eastern Orthodox Church, to some extent, permit the idea of universal salvation as a belief, and it's not considered a heresy? I think the only caveat is that you can't believe absolutely that God will save everyone because that presumes on him. But you can pretty much say, I, I believe that God will most likely save everyone. And that's permitted. I don't know exactly how they phrase it, but there is room for universal salvation within the Eastern Orthodox Church and not being seen as a heretic. Absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, it's called a theolegomenon. It's neither heresy nor doctrine. Theo means God. Legomenon means um, word. It's a private word from God that you get. Uh, that's kind of the way they look at it. And it's definitely a minority view, but it's definitely uh, an open view within the Eastern Orthodox Church. In fact, a number of years ago, I was when I was still thinking about this whole issue, I, I'm not even sure if I had started to write. My, I don't think I started to write my book yet. But um, I was at a conference, and there was a man who was a, uh, a fairly high priest within, he was a bishop, I think, um, within the Eastern Orthodox Church, one part of that. And uh, I asked him, um, by the way, are you familiar with the term apokatastasis, which means that's the, the Greek word for restoration? And he said, oh, yeah. He said, um, Gregory of Nyssa believed that. Gregory of Nyssa is man I mentioned earlier, who actually added the phrase, I believe in the life of the age to come, to the Nicene Creed. Mm -hmm. And what the Eastern Orthodox Church really focuses on the creed, um, that this is what, in fact, the Nicene Creed is the only true statement of faith of the Christian Church. Everything else that you see as statements of faith are really statements of uh, distinctives that they have. Uh, individual group, uh, groups, because the Nicene Creed was the only creed that was decided upon by the entire Christian church. And it even has a statement at the end of it saying, you shall not change this creed. Well, the creed talks about the deity of Christ. It talks about the uh, the Trinity, uh, the aspect of who God is, God's creation, etc. cetera. Um, but it doesn't talk, it says that there will be judgment but it doesn't talk about a lot of the specifics. It doesn't get into baptism. Is, is baptism of infants or only believers? Is uh, Christ going to return premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial? Um, is um, all these other, you know, is the, the, the way you structure the church to be um, uh, what is it, congregationalist or Presbyterian or Episcopalian? That, all that stuff is not there. Because they're focusing on what was really important to the Christian church. And uh, so anyway, the issue of hell was not uh, addressed in that creed, specifically because there were, at the time, people that believed in all three different views. Some believed in endless punishment. Some believed in annihilation. The majority believed that God would ultimately restore all, including Gregory of Nyssa, who, as I said, added that phrase to the, um, the Nicene Creed. But yeah, the, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church, you gotta remember, we live in Western civilization. Western civilization primarily takes its directive from the Roman Church as opposed to the Eastern Orthodox Church, when you get into the, the uh, time of that. And the Roman Church primarily follows the teaching of Augustine, St. Augustine, who was the strongest 
proponent of endless punishment in the ancient world. He came along a little later than some of the other people. And interestingly, this is really kind of fascinating, Augustine, who became really the major theologian within the uh, Western church, didn't read Greek. So he read the, the Bible in its Latin translation, the New Testament, its Latin translation, as opposed to actually reading the original Greek. Whereas Gregory of Nyssa, uh, Theodore of Mopsuestia, um, Clement of Alexandria, a lot of these early uh, Christian leaders who believed in the ultimate restoration of all, uh, of all, they not only read Greek, the Greek of the New Testament, that was their native language. They understood the nuances of the, the, the various terms that were used, whereas Augustine did not. But he was the, the one that the Western church basically followed. And then you've got the Reformation that, again, it's still within the Western church. So the Western church doesn't allow for ultimate restoration, whereas the Eastern church does. They're the ones that really read the original New Testament in its original language. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that might present a challenge to us, but at the same point might actually present hope is the idea of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And the reason I say that is because on the one hand, it says all other sins will be forgiven except this one, which would seem to indicate that it's a very exceptional sin to begin with. And that most other people's sins will be forgiven. So unless you go to blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, you know, eventually you, it would look like you would be um, reconciled back. I think the thing that might answer the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is that it's probably a small fraction, like probably less than 1%. But that those that do may end up having their soul or mind totally destroyed but then what's left is reformed and brought back to God. So in a sense, it's like what Christ said, you're losing your soul, but that soul is still being ultimately reconciled. So is that still some, a form of universal reconciliation that all souls would be saved, but it wouldn't necessarily promise 100% every person in terms of their memories and, and consciousness would be saved? Is that, I mean, how would you understand that well, as a possibility? Yeah. Uh, I, I would disagree with the part about I would disagree with the part about uh, every person not having their memories and their person being saved. With regard to the blasphemy, uh, the Holy Spirit. Again, I cover that in my book. I, I cover all the the very specific ones that uh, that people uh, challenge on that. But the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You're right in saying that yeah, all sins of mankind will be forgiven. However, the the sin of the blasphemy of blaspheming the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven in this age or in the age to come. By the way, a number of English virgins will say the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. That, that word never is not in the original text. It will not be forgiven. And then in Matthew, I think it says in this age or in the age to come. It doesn't say anything about the ages after the age to come because there are plural ages to come. But you've got to think about well, what is blaspheming the Holy Spirit? It's basically saying that when the Holy Spirit tells me something, I resist it, and I say no to God. Well, if the Holy Spirit is coming in to convict me of sin, and I resist that, and I say, no, I'm not sinning, I'm doing something really good. Well, there's no way that can accept, you can, that can be saved, that can be uh, forgiven, because it's just re um, resisting God's salvation. But once that person recognizes that's stupid, and then says, you know, that was really forget that's really stupid. At that point, then the person can be uh, uh, forgiven and brought into God's kingdom. So uh, resisting the Holy resisting the Holy Spirit while you're resisting the Holy Spirit, you're not going to experience the forgiveness of sins. But once that ends, once you stop resisting, well, then that's going to happen. How many times have you? I know in my life. I've said a lot of times, no to God. I mean, God's spirit came to convict me, and I said, no. Well, does that mean that it's never I'm never going to be forgiven, and I'll never be able to get into heaven? No. It just means that at that point, while I'm still resisting, I'm not experiencing God's forgiveness. But once that stops, or I stop resisting, then the forgiveness is, is uh, available. Was there 
do you believe in the idea of perseverance of the saints or eternal security that once you do truly embrace Christ, there's no turning back, that you couldn't effectively lose your salvation? I don't think you can lose your salvation. Again, I'm my belief is that ultimately everyone will gain salvation. So whatever happens in this life, whether you're resisting God or not resisting God, all that kind of stuff, um, it's really somewhat of a moot point for me. Um, but no, I do believe that if you have, if God has come in and transformed your life, the Apostle, Apostle Paul says, you know, if, um, uh, what does he say? Uh, well, I continue in sin once I've experienced uh, the power of God at work in my life? No, uh, that's not going to happen. And again, um, there's no reason to believe that God's transforming work isn't transforming. You know, I mean, if God is going to transform the Apostle Paul, so he was Saul and now he's Paul, and literally transform his life, he's transformed. He doesn't want to do the things he used to do. Um, I look at my life and I think, God transformed my life. I mean, I was going in one direction. God came to me. He spoke to me clearly. And I turned into another direction because he transformed the direction I was going in. And uh, so, no, I mean, yeah, I believe in the, the uh, perseverance of the saints or eternal security, whatever you want to say. But again, within the idea of um, can, a, like, can a person backslide, you know, and get back into sin? Well, yeah, obviously that you've seen that happen. Sometimes it's because a person was never really a Christian in the first place or never really experienced the power of God at work in their lives. Other times it may be because he or she was deceived or whatever. But ultimately, God is going to come in, open up the mind and heart of that person to recognize the sin that was there and to turn from it and then accept the forgiveness that God provides through uh, grace in Christ. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've looked at this, but besides the scriptures itself and obviously the early church fathers, it seems like one of the strongest arguments for um, ultimate reconciliation is the near-death experience because and a, a lot of apologists are starting to come around to the NDE because they're starting to see that it seems to support Christianity because there's God it says that Jesus is the son of God Jesus died on the cross for our sins that he'll return the Bible's inspired I, when you start to research it you see it's lines up with Christianity pretty much for the most part but then there's also kind of this element they, they kind of get a little uncomfortable with. But yeah, it seems to be kind of universalist too. You know, and it, it does seem like the NDE, the closest version to the truth in terms of religion is Christian universalism. I don't know if you've ever looked yeah, at I the would, NDE. I've looked at it a little bit. I um, There was actually one um, author of a book on near-death experiences down in Texas, um, who wrote to me, and he was really quite excited about what I was saying. And I read his book, and I makes a pretty strong case. You know, <laughs> I remember when I was in seminary, um, the uh, we took a, a natural counseling course, and uh, they talked. I think the woman's name was Elizabeth Kubler Ross, and she was one of the people that initially started to do um, a study on. Well, I guess that was grief. Um, maybe I'm mixing it up, but anyway, but, you know, some of the ideas of near death, death experiences, but, you know, you kind of go through this tunnel, there's a bright light on the other end, a feeling of warmth and love that certainly fits in with who scripture says God is. I mean, God is this great being. I mean, he's not pleased with people when they turn away from him. Um, but you would expect that when you come into the presence of God, you would experience that, that feeling of warmth and love. I, I was just talking with a friend not too long ago who uh, uh, is a charismatic, and uh, he said uh, he went to a, a service where this preacher came up to him. He was, a, at the time, he was a complete agnostic, and even uh, he thought it was a bunch of hooey, but he was bringing his mother, I think, to uh, this evangelist for healing. And he said this man put his hand on his chest and all of a sudden he fell back onto the floor. And for about five minutes, he felt warmth and love 
unlike he's ever felt before. And I thought, well, I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but that's, that certainly seems consistent with who God is. And again, I can't take near-death experiences um, as gospel truth, but it certainly seems consistent with what Scripture says about who God is and what he's going to do. So um, I, I think that's a, I mean, because you've got some, I, I mean, there was one 18 minutes in hell or something like that a book that was uh, written and talking about these terrible, wicked things. But again, the person came back from there. It was kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing it so that I will turn away from it or something. I, I don't know, but it, you know, I'm not saying ultimate restoration does not say that hell does not exist. There is a place of punishment or um, after death chastisement or whatever, however you want to say it. Um, but it doesn't last forever. And it's meant to restore, not just to punish. That's really the key. The purpose is to restore, not just to punish. Interestingly, I, uh, a number of years ago, um, I went to Rwanda with a group of Christians. And uh, we had uh, we were there for like 10 days or something, two weeks. I can't remember how long it was. But anyway, it was a wonderful opportunity to go to a, a, a country that in 1994 had a genocide. And within, I think it was eight months, four months, something like that, almost a million people were murdered. Because the government had commanded that people do that. It was just this horrific, horrific thing. Well, I was there probably 2014, 20, somewhere in that uh, time frame. And um, what I was amazed at was people were very open about the genocide. Almost everyone I talked to in uh, Rwanda had had a person in their family, close relative or close friends, who had died as a result of the uh, genocide. A number of them actually had children who were the children of people who had been killed. Uh, at one point, they took care of those people. And uh, and yet there was a country. And they were very open about it. And I was kind of shocked. I thought, why did this not tear the country apart completely? And uh, as I talked to a couple of uh, pastors and religious leaders that I had an opportunity to to engage in, one of them said, we were able to restore the country because we focused, we realized that it was not just enough to punish, we had to restore. We didn't want just to punish those people that did the bad things. And some of them were punished fairly severely, but we had to restore. And so therefore, they did whatever they could to restore Rwanda to the kind of to a a country again by experiencing forgiveness. And the interesting thing is, it was the Christian church that led the way. It was the Christian church in Rwanda that actually led the way to forgiveness and reconciliation. Again, because they realized it was not enough to just punish, they had to restore. And I think that's what God is. It's not just, hell is not just enough to punish somebody. He didn't want to just punish the apostle Paul, He wanted to transform him, restore him to a position where he would be able to be a servant of the Lord. And when I say restoration, by the way, it's not just returning creation to where it started out. It's not just going back to the Garden of Eden. It's restoring it to what it was intended to be so that in the end, God will look again on creation and say, it is very good. Because all those people that he created will be in his presence. All will have acknowledged their need for God's grace. All will have accepted that grace and experienced the forgiveness that comes from uh, that acceptance. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever noticed, too, is that one of the big objections people have is, I've always been taught that you can't be saved after death. And post-mortem salvation presents a problem And what I presented when I wrote about comparing the Bible and the near-death experience is that death is a transition that it's not just an immediate thing that you you sort of transition through. And that's that's what the near-death experience was actually talking about, too, and science is backing this up. Because a lot of people saw like the silver cord was still attached while they were having the experience. 
and that the reason they were able to come back is because they didn't completely die. But what happens is that I believe when you go into the light, many of these people are experiencing their born again moment that are they're getting saved right there in the light. And even the ones that descend into hell and God rescues them out, you know, they're still not completely dead. And there's people that have descended into hell and they said, it felt like I was there for centuries or millennia. That could be the eons of time, like in the Bible, but eventually they get saved out. So it may be possible that the vast majority of people that will ultimately be saved are saved as they're transitioning over, you know, and, and don't get saved after complete death anyway. There may be a small percentage that are saved where they're totally dead, but that may account for most salvations that people find troubling of what about post-mortem salvation. Most salvation may still be within um, the silver cord being attached. I don't know if you've ever thought about that idea. Yeah, I have. Uh, interestingly, the only verse that I see within Scripture that says that death is the end, and you're going to be just the, I think it's um, Hebrews nine twenty something right around there. Anyway, um, where it says uh, it is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. But it doesn't say what the judgment will be. I mean, you can be judged for a traffic accident or a traffic uh, violation, rather, and um, doesn't mean you're going to be get the electric chair. You know, I mean, that's just, mm -hmm. you get whatever it is there, right? Whatever the judgment happens to be. So there is something about physical death, but it doesn't necessarily mean that at that point, you're beyond God's ability to uh, to work in your life. And what you're saying, I think it's, to a certain extent, you know, it's hard to say what happened with the Apostle Paul. I mean, he says that he was caught up to the third heaven. Was that a near-death experience? I know some people that have written about it indicate, or at least refer to him as that. It's possible. Um did he, uh, he saw the bright light, right? God spoke to him, and bam, he was transformed very quickly. Well, I think that there's a lot of people that will be like that. Yeah, I, I would agree with you in that regard that, I don't know if it's the majority of people or whatever, but you know, when, they when they see God for who he is, they'll humble themselves and say, wow, yeah, I need, mean, and this is what I want. It's almost like the, you know, Peter, uh, the Apostle Peter, when Jesus um, uh, called him and uh, he suddenly sees these fish, you know, <laughs> a couple of boats full of fish coming out of this thing. And he falls down on his knees and he says, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Well, he recognized that there was something there, that he recognized his own sin and recognized the goodness and power of I think that that will probably take place with a lot of people that go through those near-death experiences and even death. I mean, we don't know what happens because mm -hmm. none of us have actually, but um, that some people, when they die, that's when they see the face of God, Jesus, more clearly than ever before, and they'll acknowledge it right away. Others may not. Who knows exactly what happens there, but I don't think it's at all... Um, erroneous to believe that that may happen to a, a very, very large number of people. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and you know how the Bible says that we will have to give an account for everything that we did in our life. And the life review that they talk about, basically you experience everything that you caused others, all the harm that you caused to others, all the good that you caused to others, you'll experience it as they experienced it. So for me, that kind of answers the Hitler question, because Every the millions of people he harmed, he's going to experience all the harm that he caused, so he's not getting away with anything. And in, on top of that, he may have went to hell for eons of time in addition to that. I don't know, but it's like Hitler's going to face enough wrath and judgment. I don't think you really need to worry about it, but he doesn't need to be there without end necessarily, exactly. And again, Christ took on the punishment that we deserved. You know, there's a lot of things that we deserve that we're not going to experience. Um, we will be made aware of those things, I'm sure, but I'm grateful that I've got a Savior that uh, 
stepped in on my behalf, so I don't have to worry about it anymore. And, and yeah, Hitler's not, and nobody gets away with anything. I mean, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, he also shall reap. So one way or another, people don't get, they don't get away with sin. You know, we, we look at the, we look at the world through our small blinders, you know, of what we see. We only see a little bit what is really going on in people's lives. And, you know, I look at um, two of the most wealthy people in the entire world, uh, Jeff Bezos and um, uh, Bill Gates can't even keep a marriage together. <laughs> it's like, guys, you know, this is, you've got phenomenal wealth, influence like nobody you can imagine, and you can't even keep a decent relationship with your wife. Like, you know, I don't know what it was like in their relationship before, but it certainly wasn't a happy place to be. So they're experiencing all kinds of negative consequences that occur in their lives. Um, that we know nothing about, you know, so, uh, or you look at um, Robin Williams, right? Phenomenal actor and uh, comedian. And he kills himself. All kinds of money. I think he was married a few times. Um, each one of them kind of took his <laughs> money from him. He had a whole bunch of alimony that had to pay, whatever. But he was not a happy person. He was not somebody who was experiencing joy in any way. Then you look at some of these people, it's always interesting to me that whenever you have a church sending a group of young people on a mission trip, they usually come from, you know, if you come from America, you come from a pretty wealthy area as far as the world is concerned. They all come back and they're almost always acknowledging that, wow, these people had nothing, but a lot of them were really, really happy. Well, there's something there, you know, and some of these kids have had everything and they weren't very happy. So, yeah, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, he will also reap. But um, within that, God is a gracious God who gives forgiveness and salvation um, to mankind. Is that sort of, do you think that might be the lake of fire? Is that the judgment and the lake of fire are kind of together and that you're sort of tried, you're purified? but you also have to experience some of the harms you caused others. And I'm kind of hoping that if you've embraced Christ and you've repented, maybe some of the, the fire or the, the pain will be sort of lessened or you won't end up seeing some of those things that you caused harm to others. Yeah, you don't. Right. If Christ has died for our sins, then we don't need to experience the punishment unless we're resisting things. But um, the lake of fire, uh, fire in the ancient world was used to purify. That's the whole point. Um, it purified things with fire. It wasn't just to punish. I mean, you didn't go around burning people up because you didn't like them. You burned things up because you wanted to purify them. And uh, so it's a purification. Well, the lake of fire is a place of purification. So that may well be the, what you're talking about there, that, that God is at work to purify um, and the lake of fire, that's exactly what happens in the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. So if people want to get in contact with you, where can they get in contact with you? Well, they can um, get my book. I would just encourage them to do that. Heaven's Door is Wider Than You Ever Believed. Um, it won the silver medal in the Illumination Book Awards for exemplary Christian literature, silver medal in, in theology. Um, and uh, I also, by the way, have a short booklet that one will take you a few hours to read. This is a short booklet called How Wide Are Heaven's Doors? And that you can read in a half hour. And it gives a basic argument for ultimate restoration. So if anybody would like to do that, you can go to amazon.com and order those. Um, and uh, you can go to my website, uh, heavensdoors.net. I haven't updated it in a while, but it's got um, uh, my email address there that you can uh, email me if you needed to do that. Um, so I guess uh, I have a Facebook page for George W. Saris, which is a public one. And then there's a George Saris, which is a private one. And uh, people can, I guess, message. I'm not very good with um, social media. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm 74 and I'm technologically challenged. When it comes to some of that stuff, 
I don't do it very well, but they can always contact me. My actual um, email address is my name, George Saris at gmail.com. So if you ever want to get in touch with me, you can contact me at George Saris at gmail.com. Is there like a final word you'd like to leave with the audience? Oh, huh. I hadn't thought about that. I ought to think about that. Yes, what I would say is God is good. That's the bottom line. God is good. He's all wise. He's all powerful. He's all loving. And he never gives up on anyone. He won't give up on you. He won't give up on the ones you love. And he won't give up on the people you don't love. Because God is going to accomplish all that he intended at the very beginning. As I said before, at the beginning, after he made his creation, he said, he looked out, God looked out on all that he had made, and he said it was very good. And at the end of time, God will look out again on all that he has made. And he will say, it is very good. Oh, well, thanks for coming on today. It's a privilege. Really a privilege. I thank you, Jay, for inviting me. I really want to make a difference in people's lives. I want to give value back. I want to see lives transformed. That's always been my goal, whether it's with my writing, this podcast, or the online courses that I teach. I want to make a difference. So I've just, what I've decided to do is every first and third Friday of the month, I'm going to be offering three of my most popular eBooks absolutely free. You can go to Amazon on those Fridays and get them absolutely free. Also on October 28th of this month, 2022, you can get these three copies free as well. You can receive Walk as Children of the Light, Heaven's Truth, or Meditation for Everyone on the first and Friday of every month on Amazon for free. See the link below for these books. And after you read them, you can help share in this blessing as well. Pass it on to your friends. Tell your friends about these three books. Write a review. Writing a review can actually help because it not only helps me, but it helps Amazon to put the book out there to more people.